<laughs> You're listening to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. And now here's your host, Big Anklevich and Rish Outfield. Good day, Bruce. Good day, Bruce. Welcome to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction. I can't do it. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. Volume 2, number 1, page 23. I am Rish Outfield. And I'm Big Anklevich. Robot. Right. 08OT. Nice one, 08OT. Announcer guy. <laughs> We're all here. Cheer, cheer. The team's here. Could we do the show if announcer man didn't show up? Uh, huh? Well, considering that he's just a recording, yes. <laughs> oh, crap. Did I give something away? You're mocking me, aren't you? <laughs> Today's episode is Time in a Rice Bowl by Rick Kennett. Once again, a sequel. The original story was called She's a Mighty Fine Sheila. Also, Not at all stuck up. <laughs> oh, Australia, 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 we love you. Amen. Amen. Rish, you're such an idiot. The original story was The Seas of Castle Hill Road, which we did back in November 2008. Rick Kennett is a lifelong resident of Melbourne. Melbourne? Melbourne. It's spelled <laughs> Melbourne, say it that way. <laughs> Thank you very much, Bruce. You're very welcome, Bruce. Rick Kennett is still a lifelong resident of Melbourne, where he is still working in the transport industry. However, he can now add Doonstief Audio Fiction Magazine to his list of publications, such as Weird Tales, Year's Best Fantasy and Horror, Gaslight Grimoire, Fantastic Tales with Sherlock Holmes, Edge Books Canada, and maybe I should do that. Okay. Fantastic Tales with Sherlock Holmes. Edge Books Canada. What was with the weird accent? And his first work in translation coming out later this year in the Russian language magazine Science Fiction it's Reality. <laughs> and though he doesn't know a word of Russian, he says it won't stop him from looking for typos and printing errors. Time in a Rice Bowl originally appeared in the booklet The Reluctant Ghost Hunter, a collection of three Ernie Pine stories published in the Haunted Library in the UK in 1991. Ten years later, it turned up in his POD collection of 13 ghost stories, imaginatively titled 13, a collection of ghost stories from Jacobite Books. He says it sold probably about 20 copies. In 2004, the story was reprinted again, and Andromeda Spaceways in-flight magazine number 11. We'd also really like to thank Cameron Horsborough for providing our narration today, Deb Sampson for doing the voice of Rhoda, Belinda Raisin for the voice of Christine, and Ildiko Shishani for the voice of Raisa. Wonderful job from all you guys. Thank you so much. Time in a Rice Bowl by Rick Kennett. It was midnight. Numb with sleep, I was wondering if I'd heard my sister right, or whether there'd been some interference on the phone line. Her ten-year-old daughter had disappeared. Christine had turned into a Chinaman and disappeared. Rhoda, talk sense. I was only now beginning to wake up, beginning to think, God, here she goes again. Ernie, will you? Please, please help me. You're the only one I can turn to who knows about these things. Rhoda, listen, have you taken anything? Pills or... You're not listening to me. There was a sudden silence, then a sort of a sob that made me think she was only just hanging on to her reason. Her voice, trembling, said... Can you get over here straight away? I'll be there as fast as I can. Not here. Not the house. Gower Street. Do you remember Gower Street? No, not really. Right now, I was having trouble remembering what day it was let alone a street in a suburb I hadn't lived in since I was a kid. Up Darren Road, she told me. Through the railway gates to the top of the hill, second street on the left, the vacant block next to the pizza parlour on the corner. Hurry! I don't know how long the laundry will stay there! It was close to half twelve when I hit the freeway, the bike's twist grip wrapped back against the stops, the taco almost redlining. 
Rhoda had once verged on a nervous breakdown when her husband was killed in an industrial accident two years before. For a time she spaced herself out on tranquilizers, and I knew if it hadn't been for Christine, Rhoda might have prescribed for herself a shorter, more intense course of sleeping pills instead. So what was the meaning of this Chinaman thing? A relapse? I hope not. Yet thinking of the alternative didn't make me feel any better. You're the only one I can turn to who knows about these things. Darren Road was a blur of street lighting. The railway crossing had me airborne a moment as I roared across it. I slowed for the left turn, leaned the machinery into Gower Street and braked. The bike slewed into the gutter and stopped. Rhoda came running out of the darkness, hauling me off the bike hardly before I'd got out from under my helmet. Quick, quick! She hurried me into the lot. Underfoot and roundabout, grass poked up from the broken brick foundations of a long-ago house. I half believed Rhoda now, and had horrible ideas about what she was leading me to. Have you called the police? I said. Of course not! She said, as if it had been the stupidest question ever uttered. Her voice rang off the walls on either side. I glanced about the empty street, hoping nobody had heard. This is nothing the police could handle, Rhoda continued, quieter, but still with that on-the-edge tone. That's why I called you. Eh? Since when do I specialise in little girls turning into Chinamen? All the same, I was beginning to have my suspicions, and it was turning me cold. I grabbed her shoulders and spun her round. There was no grog on her breath, but it was too dark to see her eyes properly. She pulled away. Ernie, I'm telling you the truth. You've tripped out on us before. Christine's here. You've got to believe me. You've got to help me. I hesitated. I'd seen and heard weird before, having had close and unpleasant experience of the supernatural in the past. Yet Rhoda was quite capable of making all this up and then believing it if she'd gone on another binge. I said as calmly as I could, Tell me what happened. Rhoda took no notice. She stood in the middle of the lot, staring up, then to either side at nothing. You'll see it soon, she said. See what? I was almost sure now she'd slipped off the deep end again and was going under for the third time. Almost sure. See what? Smell it? It's nearly... nearly... I sniffed, faintly smelling soapy steam, though I didn't stop to wonder who might be boiling up washing at this hour. Rhoda, tell me what... Walls flashed into existence around us, there for an instant, dissolving again into nothing. And in that instant, the smell of laundry had intensified, hitting my nose like a blow. There! Rhoda cried. Did you see it? Did you see it? Calm down and tell me what this is! Calm down? Hell! I could hear panic growing in my own voice. I don't know what this is. All I know is that Christine's lost in it somewhere. The walls blinked into existence again, looking utterly solid with its peeling, candy-stropped wallpaper. We were in a passageway. At the far end I saw big tubs under the open sheds, all shrouded in steam. The walls vanished. Now do you believe me? Said Rhoda, making me feel like a doubting fool. The smell of laundry hung faint in the air, but increasing, coming at me in waves of soapiness. Rhoda raced towards the back of the lot, yelling, Christine! Christine! And once again I was looking down that passageway, with Rhoda running into a long dead backyard. The walls flickered like a faulty neon as reality kicked in and out. I charged down the passage after Rhoda, slipping on grass, tripping over bricks and stumbling through the walls like a ghost. I fell into the backyard. Rhoda! Christine's here. I know she's here. Half seen in the flickering steam, my sister ran back and forth between the sheds of bubbling tubs, log fires burning beneath them. Behind it all, a tree by the back fence was madly alternating between a slender sapling and gnarly old age. The sapling, the tubs, the shed shimmered and steadied a moment. Rhoda, suddenly still, stared behind me. Christine? But what was standing at the back door on bony feet, watching, was not the brown-haired little girl who smiled in crazy chatter I remembered. It was ragged, stooped and horribly thin, the face blurred like an elusive memory. Rhoda swore and rushed at the figure. I jumped to catch her, and there we were in the empty lot with her cries echoing from wall to wall, the smell of soapy steam gone. She stood where the apparition had been a moment before. I touched her arm. She didn't respond. Just stood there, turning slowly to look now here, now there, at weeds and broken bricks. There were lights on in houses where only minutes ago there'd been blind windows. 
Best I get you home, I said, guiding him back to the street. Before the cops come and bounce us both into rubber rooms. With some difficulty, I managed to get Rhoda onto the pillion seat of my bike. She kept turning to stare into the vacant lot. We arrived outside her home, just in time to see a strobing blue light go tearing down Darren Road. Rhoda refused to go to bed. I had to settle for her sitting in a chair by the front window. Christine will be all right, I told her. How do you know? Her hands were shaking. Shock was setting in. Because I know about these things, okay? Listen, I learned a lesson in trust tonight. I like to think we both did. Do you believe me that Christine will be all right? She hesitated, then nodded. Yes. I turned out the light and quietly left the room, feeling an utter bastard lying to my sister like that. The plastic plaque fitted to the bedroom door read, Christine sleeps here, in gold lettering. Beneath it was a cameo of a little girl asleep in bed. It was dark inside. As I snapped on the light, a sort of scraping sound came from near the dressing table. I had an impression of something crouching there, an impression that was gone even as I realised it. Then another sound, a muffled bump, something hit the carpet. It was a bowl of fired clay with a wide, steep-sided shape. It was filled with a clear liquid, and though it had fallen on its side, none had spilled. There was no mistake about it being a liquid. Surface tension curled down the edges. It rotated slowly in the bowl and offered little resistance to a pencil stirred through it. The pencil caused no ripples and came out perfectly dry. In fact, I couldn't make the liquid ripple at all. It just stayed there no matter what side up it was held. The outside of the bowl was streaked and clogged with dirt, as though it had just been dug up. Some cleaning and rubbing with my sleeve produced no genie, but it did uncover etchings of Chinese characters. Something, at last, was beginning to make sense. Only I didn't know what. Rhoda wore her long winter coat down to the lot, even though it was not a particularly cold day. I hadn't shown her the bowl, knowing the effect it would have on her. For the same reason, I hadn't wanted her to come down with me, though it was probably better, possibly safer, than having her rattling around her empty house. Rhoda wandered restlessly about the lot, hugging her coat close about, sunglasses hiding the red eyes she thought I hadn't noticed. Sometimes she stopped and sniffed the air, and so did I. There was nothing to smell but an occasional drift of diesel fumes from the buses on Darren Road. For some reason I thought the tree by the back fence might yield a clue. But its bark was clean of any carvings, and there were no hollows or holes where things might be hidden. On either side of what had been the backyard were concrete slabs, cracked, growing over with weeds and bearing traces of having been scorched in the long, long ago. When I showed Rhoda these, she regarded them with horror and looked away. Tell me about Christine, I said. What happened yesterday? Rhoda gave a little shrug. She came home late from school and said she'd been playing. Did she say where? With who? Maybe here. I don't know with who. Or what? Did she have anything with her? Just her school bag. Did she do or say anything out of the ordinary? You mean other than turn into an old Chinaman? I mean from the time she got home till the time that happened, I answered, more sharpish than I'd meant to. I don't know. Rhoda threw up her hands. She chatters on 13 to the dozen. Don't you listen to her sometimes? What did she do at school that day? Who did she play with? What did she find and bring home? Don't you take any notice of your own kid? You know, Rhoda, if it hadn't been for that now you see it, now you don't last night, I swear you'd been popping pills again. Rhoda rounded on me. Why don't you try being a single parent and hold down a job at the same time? See if you've got the time and energy to listen to every... Calm down. Calm down. I waited for her anger to subside. She took a deep breath and looked to left and right, but not at me. Think back to yesterday, I said, when Christine came home. You said she was late. Now, you remembered that because it was something out of the ordinary. I suppose. So you should be able to remember what you were doing when she came in. I was, uh, I was doing the ironing in the living room. Okay. Did she have anything with her? Anything with her? By her tone, I knew she suspected this to be more than a chance question. She shook her head. Just her school bag? No, wait. Not even that. I heard her go into her room first and put her bag away. Rhoda looked off into space. 
I thought that was unusual because she had to pass the living room door to get to her room, but she always comes to see me first no matter where I am in the house when she gets home. Did you ask her where she'd been? Of course I asked her where she'd been. She paused. Sorry. She said she'd been to Gower Street. Rhoda looked at me in sudden surprise. I didn't remember her saying that until just now. She said she was down in Gower Street, at the holding ground. What the hell is a holding ground, Ernie? Don't know, but it sounds vaguely familiar. It also sounded vaguely disturbing for reasons I couldn't recall. Did she say anything else? Prattle about school, I suppose. Look, I'd only been home a half an hour myself and there was a whole lot of ironing and... Okay, okay. Did she say or do anything out of the ordinary during the evening? Rhoda sighed, thought for a second. She didn't watch as much television as usual. After a few jobs, drying the dishes, letting the washing machine for the morning, things like that, she spent most of her time in her room. You know something, don't you? I don't know yet. Tell me how she disappeared. I put her to bed at the usual hour. Sometime later, it must have been long after eleven, she came out of her room and I thought she was sleepwalking. She had that look about her, you know? Rhoda ran a hand through her hair and started walking about the lot again with me at her side. It was plain she was hating this particular memory. I saw her face wrinkling like a rotting fruit, and her hair was going black and kind of twisting into a pigtail. She walked out of the front door, and every step she took, she grew thinner and taller, then stooped and shuffled like an old man. I flew out after her but couldn't catch up, even though she was taking such small steps and I was running. I followed her to, well, to what we saw last night. A shop of some kind is how it looked from the outside, and it was shimmering with the heat haze. Christine, or whoever it was she turned into, opened the door and went in. I couldn't touch the door, couldn't feel it at all. I passed through it like it wasn't there. Then the whole thing started blinking, started fading out. I just stood there calling, Christine, Christine! I... Jesus Christ! I don't think she was even breathing. I took Rhoda in my arms and held her a moment, unable to think of anything to say short of lies. I walked her back to her place and made a pot of tea. When I returned to the lot later that morning, I started searching and soon found what I'd been hoping to find. In the middle of what had been the backyard, a bowl-shaped hollow where something had recently been dug up. After ringing our workplaces and making our excuses, flu, scarlet fever, black plague, something like that, I dropped Rhoda off at the local library in the hope she'd be able to find out something about Gower Street's vacant lot by the local historical society. We're not done yet, I told her as we parted. Christine's safe and we'll find her. But I asked myself, how the hell do you know? All the way down Railway Avenue to the town hall, the bike's rear view mirrors kept giving me glimpses of a white blur dodging about the trees behind me. When I pulled up outside the town hall, I gave the avenue a good long look. It was empty and still, save for autumn leaves spilling along in a stray breeze. Most would have put it down to imagination and forgotten it. I let it go to the back of my mind where I knew it would pour at me. There was less bureaucracy in red tape than expected in finding the title deed to the lot in Gower Street. It appeared to have been a commercial laundry around the turn of the century, owned by a certain Mr Lee Ho Chin. Circa 1912, the property was seized by local authorities for back taxes and non-payment of rates. The building was demolished, and that, apparently, was that. All I had was a name and a time. No reasons why. I biked slowly back down the avenue, watching the trees, watching the mirrors, seeing no white blur this time. Back at my place, I looked up holding ground in an occult encyclopedia, flipping through the pages with an awful foreboding. I knew the term in connection with something I couldn't quite remember. Something not at all pleasant. And when I found it, I thought of Christine and broke down. It said, Holding ground. See. Death march. I made a cold meat salad for tea. Rhoda was in no mood for cooking, and even less for eating. What's Christine having for tea tonight? She said, toying with a salt shaker on the kitchen table. 
She had had no luck with the historical society and had greeted my discoveries at the town hall with a dull. So what? Names are handles to grab, I told her. How will that return my daughter? I took the salt shaker from her fidgeting fingers. She took it back and pulled away. I tried to get in contact with the witch today, I said. Tried to. That means you failed. Whatever answered the phone sounded like furniture being shifted around but shaped into a voice. It promised to pass on the message. So now I'm putting my trust in the noise of tables and chairs being shoved about. Rhoda lifted her eyes to the empty chair on the other side of the table, tucked in neat against the edge. Do you want a drink? I asked. Yeah, sure. Let's go down the pub and get pissed, paralytic. She shook her head. No, I don't need booze or pills for a crutch anymore, Ernie. I won't do Christine any good with my face down the loo or a stomach pump down my throat. Good for you. You asked me this morning if I knew anything. I left the kitchen, went into Christine's room and returned with a Chinese bowl. I plonked it down in front of Rhoda. She looked at me with a sort of dull surprise. Like a stage magician demonstrating that there was nothing up my sleeves, I showed her the contents of the bowl. Showed her it was not a solid by taking her hand and dipping in her finger. It caused no ripples. I turned the bowl on its side. She stared at it for a good 30 seconds in a mixture of astonishment and horror. What the hell is it? She said at last. A long time ago in China, when a man or woman died far from their native province, sometimes a relative or friend would find a wizard and pay him to reanimate the corpse and lead it home. The wizard would wait until he had a number of these commissions, stored buried but undecayed in what was called a holding ground. Then he'd set out on something known in Chinese magic as the Death March. These dead people would walk in single file, with the wizard in front holding a rice bowl of water out before him. When they reached their destination, the water was spilt on the ground and the bowl broke into bits. Only then could the bodies decay and their souls rest in peace. But why is the bowl like it is? said Rhoda, regarding it with a look usually reserved for things dragged from blocked sewers. I think time inside the bowl is frozen, which is one serious piece of magic, believe me. I think a death march spell was begun, but not completed. What are you trying to tell me? Christine unearthed that bowl in the Gower Street lot a few hours before she disappeared. Which means... I put my head in my hands. I don't know. And quite frankly... Neither do I, said a voice from the bowl. We jumped up so quickly the chairs crashed over. The voice was female, familiar, and decidedly non-oriental. Slowly, cautiously, Rhoda and I peered into the bowl. The face in the water was three-dimensional, more than a mere image. She had scraggly blonde hair, looked forty or so, and although unsmiling, her eyes twinkled somehow. Raisa, I yelped. Who? said Rhoda, eyes wide. Raisa, the witch! I'm not a witch. Sorry. She prefers mage, I said to Rhoda. If you call her a witch, she's likely to turn you into a frog. I'll turn you into worse than a frog if you don't tell me what this is about. I'm in the middle of one of my own investigations, you know. How much have you heard? I asked. Since you fetched the bowl from that other room? I assume I'm reaching you through the Death March rice bowl. Strange feeling in that other room, by the way. A great deal of psychic activity there quite recently. Can you tell me what happened to my daughter? Rhoda said. My sister Rhoda, I said. Her daughter Christine found this bowl on the site of an old Chinese laundry yesterday. And last night she turned into an old Chinese bloke and walked out of the house. Rhoda took over the story, leaning closer to the bowl, not giving a damn how bizarre things got if they helped give back Christine. She described the circumstances of the disappearance and how she'd followed her daughter to the flickering ghost of a long demolished house. Time is. Time was. Raisa muttered to herself when Rhoda had finished. I must admit to being stumped. I don't see the connection between Christine's disappearance and some ongoing death march spell, particularly as that piece of sorcery is one of the most benevolent and commercial bits of magic in the Chinese cookbook. If young Christine disturbed the spirits of the dead buried in that vacant block, there's bound to be at least one corpse buried there, they would simply have taken the bowl back. If time can be frozen, then reclaiming the bowl would be a parlour trick. Then why take Christine and leave the bowl? Rhoda asked. Exactly, said Raisa, and felt amusing. 
The power of the ball is transferred to the first to touch it after the death of the previous owner. So there must be more to this than we surmise. I think there is, I said. Something followed me to the town hall. Raisa looked up sharply from the water. What? Something followed me when I went to the town hall this morning to check the history of the lot. You didn't tell me this, said Rhoda. I wasn't sure. Besides, you've got enough to worry about. What did you see? Raisa asked. A vague shape, white I think, darting in and out from behind trees, keeping to the shadows. Might have seen it last night too in Christine's room. Couldn't be sure, but if there was something, I might have caught it trying to steal a bowl. Any idea what it could have been, Raisa? There's no saying for sure. A familiar that's lost its master? A displaced demon or elemental? There's half a hundred other things that blow in the midnight wind, and it could have been any one of them. If there was something trying to snatch the bowl, it was probably because... used the wrong way. The bowl has the power to enslave the dead. Now, if we can adjourn to that other room again, I'd like to have another feel of its atmosphere. As we left the kitchen, I said, By the way, what are you using to receive us at your end? A television set, said the witch. Practically every house has one these days, and it's easier than carrying a scrying mirror or crystal ball. I put the bowl down on its side on the dresser, then sat down with Rhoda on Christine's bed, which was still unmade. Raisa, her face framed in the bowl, closed her eyes and a look of deep concentration passed over her. She remained like that for maybe half a minute, then her features twisted in fear and disgust. Something hideous happened in this room. She paused, her face relaxed. And something beautiful. Rhoda pressed close to the bowl. Is Christine alive? Depends what you mean by alive, said Raisa, trace-like. If you mean running, laughing, growing, breathing... She is not alive. Dead, said Rhoda, sounding dead herself. Depends what you mean by dead. If you mean oblivion and decay, she is not dead. Raisa rubbed her forehead. Quickly, take the bowl from this room. I need to rest. Back in the kitchen, Raisa asked for two mirrors. Rhoda brought in a hand mirror and wall mirror, complete with its chain. With these and some awkwardness, we gave Raisa an all-round view of the etchings on the outside of the bowl. She went, hmm, a lot in a disappointed way in once, ah, and made notes. Unfortunately, she said as we put down the mirrors, I can't make out most of it. Likely it's a magical formula in a personal cipher. However, there's a small engraving like a dragon and a name. Feng Meng Lung. Lung? I said. Don't you laugh? There are places in this world where the name Ernie Pine would have them in fits. Now, this Feng Meng Lung was one of the most notable adepts in old Shanghai. He came to Australia and settled locally about the time of the last gold rush. As I understand it, he used to practice his art with the local Chinese community. Potions, charms, healing and the like. He was killed in something of a minor race riot and was buried in the North Ferns General Cemetery on January 11th, 1910. Names and dates, said Rhoda with returning impatience. How does that help bring back Christine? Names and dates will help you find the grave, Rhoda, said the witch. And when you do, you must raise Feng Meng Lung from the dead. There's only two things worse than being talked about, and that's not being talked about, and being talked about by ghosts. Dark clad figures wandered the aisles and paths in the cemetery distance, passing, pausing, nodding, looking our way. Rhoda told me not to be silly, that they were mourners and hurried me along. I had a feeling they were residents. With the map and instructions received at the administration office, Rhoda led the way past marble mausoleums and small wooden crosses past graves of centenarians and babies, and over the strict borders fencing off religion and race. The old Chinese section was a strip of lawn hard by the bottom fence. Chinese grave markers like big stone icy pole sticks, thin, tall slabs, rounded at one end, jammed into the ground at the other, the who, what and when of the occupant inscribed down the centre. Hardly any like that were to be seen here. The whole section had been heavily vandalised, 
Stones were either snapped off at the base or shattered into angry scimitar shapes jutting from the grass. The lack of any rubble and the weathered edges of the broken stone showed the damage to be old, perhaps many decades old. Only one stone stood intact, but its inscribed characters were worn and faded. With a stub of pencil we outlined what we could find of the inscription, then compared it to the characters on the bowl which Raisa had said were the wizard's name. It looked similar, but I couldn't be sure. And was that a worn carving of a dragon at the top, or just pitting? It has to be his grave, Rhoda said. Don't you see, Ernie? It's his magic that's kept it safe while all the others have been smashed. It has to be. It was desperate reasoning, but she had a point. If the spirit of Feng Meng Lung still survived, it might have protected his grave all these years. And if so, it could still have an effect on the Death March spell. Try it, said Rhoda. She handed me the bowl. Yes, I was the pigeon. I'd been the first to touch the bowl after Christine's disappearance, and therefore, so Raisa explained, the only one able to use its magic. In fact, the power would remain with me until either I'd died, the bowl was broken, or until it was reclaimed by its creator. And he's welcome to it. I took the approved stance before the grave, the bowl cupped in hands outstretched in front of me. A quick look around. Were those dark figures still lurking about the tombs? Were they still watching? Feng Meng Lung, arise. Nothing happened. Nothing continued to happen for a full minute. Maybe it's my accent. Say it again, said Rhoda. With feeling, and in Chinese like Razor said. Feng Meng Lung, Shi Li! The words seemed to hang in the air above the grave. An abnormal silence fell upon us. No traffic noises, no birdsong. The breeze had stilled itself. Rhoda gasped. <gasps> What? I yelped. The water. It rippled. I looked down. The water was smooth. It rippled, said my sister. I believe you. Her voices fell away into the surrounding silence. Then the sound of the breeze returning reassured me until I heard it gusting louder and stronger, a narrow wind blowing from straight ahead. It staggered us back and flattened the grass. It roared down the aisles and paths, herding up leaves and litter, twisting cemetery dust among the stones, singing through the statues and ripping at the dark-clad figures. A piece of coloured paper stung against my face, fluttering. I clawed at it, for a second thinking it was a bit of toy currency from a Monopoly game. Then I saw it was hell, or lucky money, a sort of afterlife currency burned for the dead at Chinese funerals. I went to throw it away, then thought again. Omen or coincidence? I crushed it into my pocket, too crowded with relief to feel scared now. But the figures among the graves were watching. There, and there, and there. I turned away to face the grave. The wind was dying. And very soon was once again a natural breeze. Now what happens? Rhoda whispered. God knows. I answered the same way, then went stiff with fright. The water in the bowl was clouding. On its surface a confusion of faces, old and oriental. They blurred and melted into an image of Christine. Her lips were moving, but nothing was heard. Then the vision was snatched away, replaced by a hellish face of rags. No nose or mouth, just torn eye holes. I flung the bowl from me with a cry of revulsion. It landed on edge against a broken headstone. The face of rags still there in the water. It stared. It watched me. A mouth tore open, moving with silent words, slowly, carefully, so there'd be no mistake. Christine is dead. Neither of us looked much like necromancers. Rhoda had her hair tied in a scarf and wore her long coat against the night cold. I had my scruffy jeans and bike jacket. I was also wearing runners, just in case. It was nearly two in the morning and Gower Street was as dead as those we believed lay under the vacant lot. There was no way of finding evidence of a grave, not after all these years. We could only suppose that old Feng Meng Lung's customers were buried near where the bowl had been. Finding where Christine had dug it up had been easy enough in daylight. But the hole was somewhere at the back of the lot where it was dark. There was no moon, and the street lighting didn't reach that far, blocked by the pizza parlour on one side, the Victorian terrace house on the other. We stumbled about, 
tripping over the bricks and tangled grass, searching for the hole until I practically fell into it. We should have brought a torch, I muttered, getting up. Can't afford to attract attention, said Rhoda. No, of course not. All we're going to do is raise some dead people out of the ground and maybe play follow the leader with them. But let's not do anything that might attract attention. Shh. Listen, I don't know if this will work without the wizard. And even if it does, what happens then? Do I lead them back to China or something? You're talking like you don't want Christine back. Rhoda hissed at me in the dark. Now you're the one being silly, as well as naive. You don't understand the dangers involved. This is the only way. Your witch friend said it herself. And you said that I know about these things, but now that I'm trying to warn you about them, you're not listening. We can do infinite harm to Christine by doing this, and I don't mean physically. Anyway, what's to say she will rise with the dead? Will she be alive in any way we understand? And what if old Ragface turns up again? Sooner or later, this has to be done. Anyway, that's what killed Christine. What? Something hideous happened here and something beautiful. That's what the witch said in Christine's room. Ragface killed Christine for that damned bowl and the laundryman's ghost saved her by possession. Don't you see? Not dead and not alive, I thought aloud. It was beginning to make sense. My little girl's down there in the dirt, all mixed up with the dead man. Raise him and we'll raise them both. Up until now, I thought we were alone in this. But if we had an ally on the other side of the grave, even just the chance of one. My hand sweated on the bowl as I held it out before me. Shu shu shili, I said in fractured Chinese, cribbed from a phrase book. Words my occult book said would begin the death march. Corpse, arise. The night remained still. No sudden wind this time. None of the expected trembling of the ground. I heard Rhoda searching through her bag, followed by the scratch of a match. I saw her eyes, wide and watching, caught briefly in the glare. I thought you didn't want to attract attention, I said. I've changed my mind, okay? Now at least we'll see them before we touch them. Thanks a lot. Hold the match near the bowl. I wanted to see what was looking out of it. Rhoda held up the match. We glimpsed rippling water and the match went out. Rhoda struck another one and immediately dropped it with a noise halfway to a scream. I looked down at the match, still alight, and saw a finger wriggling out of the dirt. My first impulse was to jump away, but Rhoda was down on hands and knees, striking three or four matches together as other fingers emerged and became an old man's hand. Some of the grass was dry and caught fire in little clumps. By its light, we could see the ground sprouting fingers all around. Then came the hands and arms, flexing out of shallow graves. Gradually, in four places, the earth humped up. Rhoda stood, the last of her matches burnt. The little grass fires went out. But we saw the dead rise. Saw them rise against the dim light of Gower Street. Loose dirt rattled to the ground from their ragged clothes, their hair and stringy beards. They stood a moment like weary men, absolutely still, arms hanging, heads bowed. Then one following in the other, step by stiff step, they moved towards me. I shrank back, stumbling on some rubble. Water splashed from the bowl. The dead men faltered, then came on again. So I let them, moved toward them, heard their feet fall into step behind me. What are you doing? said Rhoda. Damned if I know. I stepped out into the light, four dead men following. Christine's not among them. No, I said, turning up the street. She's probably within one of these jokers. Which is the one she turned into? Rhoda ran up beside me, looking down the line. I don't know. They're all old Chinamen, about 60 or 70. They're all in rags, have pigtails and wispy beards. Old generation traditionalists, I said as we filed under a streetlight. They're the sort who would want this particular spell. As an experiment, I slowed a bit. The corpse immediately behind it nearly stepped on my heels. I sped up again and crossed Gower Street. They followed. It didn't need a degree in physical education to know that this promenade couldn't go on indefinitely. I said, Rhoda, do you still have that Chinese phrase book handy? What's the word for stop? Just a second. She dragged the book from her coat pocket. It's Ting. 
I made a sharp U-turn and glimpsed the dead men as I went down the line. They turned where I had and kept in perfect step. I'm going to take this lot into Railway Avenue, I said. Tracks on one side, closed down shops on the other. No houses, no one to see. Why not take them back to my place? No, I need room in case they don't respond. She nodded and walked beside me, down Gower Street, into Darren Road, and round the corner. We were the only traffic on Railway Avenue, Rhoda, the dead, and I. As shadows passed on soaped windows and dirty doorways. On the other side stood the trees, spaced out into dark distance beside the railway line. As we crossed towards them, a familiar voice said in my head, Yes, it sounds like a lovely place. We've been learning about it in school. Has it been a long time since you've been home? Rhoda, it's Christine. I just heard her. In my head. Rhoda stared at me, incredulous. It's Christine, I said again. Yes, said Rhoda, believing now, wanting to believe. Yes, yes. I sometimes have dreams, but I've never dreamed this long. Do you dream, Mr Chin? What about? Can you hear her? I asked Rhoda. Her mouth worked a moment, and she nodded and said, No. I think she's talking to Lee Ho Chin, the laundryman. Can't hear what he's saying, though. Rhoda peered back along the line. None of them are speaking. It's their souls speaking. I'll, I'll see if I can get in on the conversation. I thought my niece's name several times over. It had no effect. Oblivious to me, Christine said, Mr Chin, do you think I'm dreaming you because I saw you in the vacant lot today? I looked along the avenue. Far down among the tree shadows came Ragface, dodging the pools of street lighting and darting hops too quick to catch more than a blur and flutter of white. Zigzagging, never definite, but getting nearer. It seemed to have a stuttering movement, like a film with every third frame cut out, as if it moved through an intermittent existence. I U-turned my quartet. Are you really a ghost, Mr Chin? Then you must be a nice one. My uncle Ernie chases ghosts. What's the matter? Said Rhoda. I motioned with my head behind us. Rhoda turned. Thank Christ she didn't scream. Did you really talk to Uncle Ernie when he was little? And Mum? How could they forget you? Do people always forget ghosts when they grow up? How close is it, Rhoda? She jogged up beside me. It's almost here. What's that word for stop again? Ting. Shushao, ting! They stopped. I can't wait to wake up and tell Mum about this dream. Even though sometimes she doesn't... Christine faded out as I stepped away from the dead men. I handed Rhoda the bowl. If anything happens to me, smash it. It might... Smash it? That'll kill Christine for real. If you love her, you do it. Believe me. She'd be better off truly dead than an eternal slave to that. I jerked my thumb back at the flickering oncoming thing, then turned and headed towards it. I had my doubts about Rhoda destroying the bowl if it came to it, but I had to leave it with her. It wouldn't be safe to bring it too close to Ragface. It looked a tricky customer. By now, Ragface had twitched into one of the nearby shadows. It made no sound, and it wouldn't keep central in my vision. It kept sliding to either corner of the eye, making it impossible to determine what it was outside of an impression of flapping draperies, and then it glowed. It was a thing of contradiction, made of light, and hating the light. First I tried thinking at it, things like, Go away, and shoo, and piss off! I'd have been surprised to see it work. I wasn't surprised, so I shouted, What are you? What do you want? Having read somewhere that some spirits hated being asked their purpose. Nothing changed. It remained lurking in the shadows of my peripheral vision, its outlines occasionally jerking and changing. I wondered if it was as frightened of me as I was terrified of it, whether it might be a thing of impulse rather than calculation. I felt sure it knew the rules, though, and knew it would have to kill me to gain control of the bowl. I took a chance. You coward! I'm not a sleeping child! I raised my arms and took two steps forward. It hit me a vicious blow to the mind. I staggered back, falling with the pain. Ragface jutted past, heading for Rhoda. Stop, or she'll smash the bowl! I tried to shout, and came out a half moan. The thing stopped, and I could have sworn it was tying slow knots in itself. Rhoda was looking back and forth, trying to keep the thing in sight. The bowl was raised above her head, ready to be dashed down. I started to get up, despite the feeling my brain was falling away in slices. 
Smash it, Rhoda! I yelled hoarsely. Smash it, for Christine's sake! Don't do it, Mummy! I love you! Don't kill me, Mummy! Rhoda went face up in shock. I just went cold. It had been Christine's voice all right, but it hadn't been Christine. The thing was far more cunning than I'd credited. It's not Christine! I shouted. Ragface seemed to glow more intensely, and massive pain speared me through the eyes. All I could think of was smash it! Smash it! Ragface crept closer to Rhoda, speaking in that little girl voice. And Rhoda was listening, mesmerised, her arms frozen above her with fright and indecision, facing a monstrous choice. Destroy the bowl and destroy her daughter, or give Christine undead to that thing. The pain in my head expanded. My mind stood back from itself, contemplating its end. Cerebral hemorrhage? Stroke? Reality tilted, righted, tilted again. My jacket pocket exploded. For a second I thought my head had blown up and that what was fluttering in front of me was part of my brain. Then I realised the pain had stopped. That rag face was flickering back into deeper shadows. What had erupted from my pocket was a piece of hell money that had hit me in the cemetery. It was unfolding and unfolding and unfolding far beyond its size, uncrumpling, expanding, pushing out paper shapes. It was like watching crystals form as limbs thrust out and swelled. The paper tore itself into reptile scales and jagged edges. The unfolding ceased. The last creases were pushed out smooth and the dragon stood large on the road. Ragface twitched down the avenue. The dragon moved like the wind, snatching it up in talons long like mandarin's fingernails, pushing the thing into the glare of a street light. Ragface screeched and wailed horribly. The dragon's claws opened, letting Ragface squirm flickering into the tree shadows. It cringed there, whimpering. The dragon craned down its long neck, human features on its saurian face, Asian and ancient. I thought I saw pity and regret in the eyes. Ragface tittered and gave a blinding pulse of whiteness. The dragon reeled back across the avenue. Ragface continued the attack, gathering into a blur that was impossible to look at. My headache returned, though it was probably a thousand times worse for the dragon. It was down on its belly, sawtooth tail lashing in agony. Creases reappeared in its body as it began to collapse into itself again. I yelled at Ragface loudly, carefully, so there'd be no mistake. No, Rhoda! Don't throw down the bowl now! Ragface lost its brilliance and began to swell towards Rhoda, its drapery spiralling as it slid again to the corner of my eye. A tremor of panic, of confusion, swept from it. Then panic again, a wave stronger than before. Out on the road, the dragon's body swelled, its head raising in anger. Realising the deception, Ragface arrowed across a spill of light, separating it from the shadows and its escape down the avenue. Hind claws gouging the roadway bitumen, the dragon reared back and struck like a snake, scooping Ragface in a blur of movement. This time the talons didn't slacken when the thing cried and wailed. The old Chinese face had hardened. The dragon reached into the air with one razor-bright claw and tore a rent in the darkness, showing pure white light beyond. Ragface wriggled frantically, winding tight against the claws, making noises that set my nerves and hair on end. With great deliberation, the dragon bundled Ragface up like so much dirty laundry and prodded it screaming into that tear of light. The tear disappeared. The dragon began to dissolve and dwindle, the claws changing to fingers, the body thinning, the neck shortening. Rhoda was beside me now, and I gently unclenched her fingers and took the rice bowl. We were both shaking and some of the water sloshed over the edge. The wizard Feng Meng Lung stood before us, no longer a dragon or a piece of hell money. He was a clean-shaven man, dressed in a trilby hat and high collar, waistcoat and watch chain, braces on his trousers and spats on his shoes. He stepped towards me, fading as he did. I found myself moving back to the line of dead men where I took up position again. Jin Xing, said my voice in what I suspected was beautifully modulated Mandarin Chinese, and we were off. Do you have to go now, Mr. Chin? said Christine. Will I wake up now? Her voice cut across a sing-song babble of Chinese. Only one other, like parchment crumpling, came to me loud and clear and still in English. It is time, Christine, to go home. It has been too long. Now we must all go home. Goodbye. Goodbye, Mr. Chin. Goodbye. 
I had a sudden sensation of coming unstuck from something, of pulling apart, an uplifting, passing through shadows, shadows passing through me as I fell out of line, dropping behind. I glimpsed five figures, swaying, all in step. Then they were gone. Perhaps Railway Avenue led them home. I hoped so. Uncle Ernie? said Christine behind me. Where are we? Where's Mum? I spun about, but Rhoda reached her and hugged her first. A few days later, Rhoda received a letter from the local historical society, the one that had been unable to give her any information about the vacant lot on the first day of our search. They apologised for taking so long, but said they'd finally uncovered something that might be of interest. The site has only had one building on it since European settlement, said the letter. It was a Chinese laundry from 1893 until the disappearance of its owner, Li Ho Chin, in late 1909. The site was acquired by the local authorities for back rates and taxes, and in 1912 the building was demolished. Urban legend has it that the site is haunted, sometimes by the ghost of a thin, ragged figure, sometimes by the lingering smell of laundry, and sometimes by a woman's anguished cries of Christine! Author's note. I got the idea for Time in a Rice Bowl from Here He Lies Where He Longed to Be by Winifred Galbraith, joint winner of the ghost story competition run by the British magazine The Spectator in 1930 and judged by that master of the modern ghost story, M.R. James. If you don't happen to have the Christmas 1930 edition of The Spectator handy, the story can also be found in the anthology Ghosts and Scholars. Crucible, 1987. Edited by Richard Dalby and Rosemary Pardot. More an anecdote than a piece of short fiction, Galbraith's story tells of an encounter one night deep in the jungles of China with a procession of several dead Chinese, preceded by a magician holding a rice bowl full of water. Using this as a basis for my story, I then threw a major spanner into the works of my own Chinese sorcerer's death march, followed by my reluctant ghost hunter Ernie Pine, once more hurled in, uttering a terrible scream. The villain of the piece, Ragface, stepped out of a well-known ghost photo, the tall, monkish specter standing beside the altar of Newby Church in North Yorkshire, England. Personally, I've always considered this photo to be a fake, partly because it looks staged with its empty eye hole staring straight into the camera, partly because it's casting a very perceptible shadow despite supposedly being invisible at the time the altar was photographed, and partly because I don't want to believe such a ghastly thing may be stalking us unseen between the spaces of reality. That is to say, please, 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 don't let this thing be real. All right, so that was our story. Thanks for uh, listening all the way through to it. Who read this story? This story was read by Cameron Horsborough. You made that up. What's his real name? No, that's really his name. Horsborough. Oh, I'm sorry. Cameron. It's not the town that he lives in. It's his name. Well, I see you're heading to Horsborough, sir. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, thanks a lot for doing that for us. Uh, he also read the prequel. He read the first story from Rick Kennett that we had in this series, The Seas of Castle Hill Road, for us as well. I think he does a great job. I don't believe he's narrated stories elsewhere. But, really? Uh, he does a really good job for us, I think. How did you hook up with this guy? Begged for help, and he came uh, calling. And he is in Australia right now? Yes, he is. Well, Australia, yeah. Australia, Australia, we love you. Amen. Amen. And how much, on a scale from 1 to 10, does he hate it when we do that? Probably nine, I don't know. <laughs> then, of course, there was Ildiko Shoshani, who did the voice of Raisa for us, and Deb Sampson, who did the voice of Rhoda for us, and Belinda Raisin, who did the voice of Christine for us. And they, I thought they did a great job as well. So thanks a lot for that, guys. Due to the difficulty of finding Aussie-accented people, is that an appropriate thing to say? Aussie-accented people. Due to not being able to find any Aussie-speaking readers, this one took a little while. And uh, is it true he's got a third story? In, what, what, what was it he said in the author's note? Oh, wait, I read the author's note. I should know. He's got several stories in this uh, series, I think. Ernie Pine is a long-running character for him. I think he's given him lots of adventures. The reluctant ghost hunter, Ernie Pine. There you go. I don't believe that was any accent at all. That's just... That's just the way he speaks That's how I sound in the morning, yes. So thank you, 
Rick, for once again gracing us with that. I, I think it's great when these people send us another story, a second story, because naive though I must be, I always believe, well, they liked how we did the first one. Uh, hopefully that's the case. They're not saying, well, that first time sucked, but maybe if I give them another chance, they'll do it a little better. Yeah, thanks a lot for sending us out that story. And if you've got a story that you'd like to send out, drop by our website, www.doonsteep.com, and uh, take a look at the submission guidelines, and it'll guide you right through all the steps. And if you'd like to, I don't know, instead of donate a story, maybe you'd like to donate money. Hey, we got a way to take care of that, too. On our website, there is a little button that you can press that will allow you to donate any way you please. I pressed the button. Could it be Australian dollars? It could be. New Zealand francs. Could it be Guamanian dollars? <laughs> uh, I think they use marks in Guam. Kroners, I think they're called there. Have, big, have you ever seen a ghost? No, but one time when we were driving around the bend, there was this white thing in the road. Damn your very eyes. <laughs> it turned out it was a cow, but I was still scared. Oh, wait. Sorry, that was you that did that. So no, I've never seen Then we went up to make out point, and her bra was off before we'd even put into park. Sorry, I was being you. You were being me. No, I've never seen a ghost, although last week after we finished uh, doing the podcast, I remember we were out on my front porch, and my neighbor came walking out, and you were like, oh, hey, ghost, 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 ghost. It was an elderly woman in a <laughs> nightgown just walking through the street. I guess her dog or her cat or something had gotten away, and she was walking out after it. But it was one of those things where at first I saw the white of the nightgown, and then I saw the form of the rest, and it was it was coming toward us. And I was like, a big ghost. Look at it. Yeah, instead of being terrified. I was like, so excited. Look, there's a, there's a ghost. G -g 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 ghost. But yeah, that was an interesting, fun, rollicking, good time. Uh, when I was a little, little kid and we first moved into our house, our farmhouse, if you will. And now it's time for Tell Me a Story, Mommy, with Rish Outfield. We had this dog and I, I can't even remember if the dog slept in my room very often. All I can remember is this one example. The dog's been gone for 21 years now. Sucks to get old. Don't let it happen to you, kids. Kill yourselves now while you're good and young and handsome. But anyhow, I guess I was afraid to sleep in this room by myself because we had just moved into the house. And in the middle of the night, the dog started to bark. And so my mom came out of her room and to see what was going on because, you know, the dog would normally, if it needed to go to the bathroom or something, would go in and wake them up and... But the dog was just sitting there in the room and it was barking. And she turned on the light and the dog was barking at something in the room. I didn't see what it was. I was a little five-year-old kid. She didn't see anything, but the dog was just going crazy about something <laughs> in the room. And what's weird is that's my first memory of that house was that experience with the dog. And uh, I'm not one of those people that has a lot of memories from being five or four or three years old. And really, it's just like maybe I have one memory each for those years. But this is my one for uh -huh. that year. And uh, yeah, I just remember the dog going nuts and somebody somewhere saying, well, it must have been a ghost. And I was at that impressionable <laughs> age where to this day, that's what I think of. That's what it was. There was a ghost in the room. The dog was going nuts. Uh, uh, something in the room. Turns out it was actually just a cow. You are maybe the worst person I've ever known. I was trying to <laughs> contribute something for once to the show. And <sighs> so I noticed uh, last week, or I noticed, I didn't notice last week <laughs> that we failed to mention the movie quote contest from oh, that's geez, right. like three or four episodes ago now. And it was something that we recorded right before we went our separate ways. Uh, we started our own bands. But now we've got back together. Yes, yeah, the reunion tour. You, you thought, thought it would it never happen. happen. At the froze over. That's, that's right. right. The, the Budweiser Amphitheater, Amphitheater presents one night only. No coolers, containers, or porn. Well, well some, some porn, porn. As long as it's tasteful. I'm the airbrushed kind. Oh, so, yeah. Um, I forgot where we were. Where were we before we got off on that long tangent? At the Anheuser-Busch Amphitheater. <laughs> under the stars with opening band winger. Yeah, that's right. We, we were doing that contest where there was 25 quotes and whoever got the most of them right was going to get some of your free swag. Uh, yeah, the, the, one of the t-shirts that Zach uh, Snyder gave out. 
I thought it would be cool to give out. But you know what? I'll just sell it on eBay because, hey, there are people out there that want them. They're willing to pay money rather than just answer a couple of questions. Why do you sound so bitter? Because nobody has participated in this thing. I mean, but you know what? That brings up an interesting question. Okay. You and I do this podcast every week, whether it goes on the air every week or not. And let's say that we had no listeners at all. Okay. So it's that's not, not much of a stretch. Exactly. I can, I can imagine that. And Just one we, less. We had nobody donating, nobody that's not commenting. not much of a stretch either. Would it be worth it to you that it's just you and me doing it for us or for our posterity or, or for fun? Because essentially that's what the movie trivia contest ended up being, was just you and me entertaining me. I don't even know if it entertained <laughs> you. I have a blast doing that sort of stuff. But My I easily... parts were entertaining, but your quotes were awful, so, you know. Well, then maybe that's why no one has participated. <laughs> it's hard to say. I mean, we, we don't have no listeners. There are some listeners, so we can't put it in those terms, but... It was fun for us, I think, and, and there's nothing really that we can do other than try and entertain ourselves and hope that that entertains other people as well. It's always a, a gamble, I guess, and you can't always win. Well, okay, I guess that's the question I'm asking, though, is when do you draw the line? When do you say, okay, you know what, it's not worth doing anymore? And, and I, I realize that I'm whining a little bit. Okay, so just in case there was somebody that, that heard that movie trivia contest, it was on, what episode was it on? The Edge of the Map episode. That was like the first episode of August. Okay, and it was at the very end of that or, episode, right? Actually, I think that was in July. Yeah, it was, because I listened to it at Comic-Con. Or I was in line for something I would never get into. <laughs> yeah, they would have people come out that were members of the security with walkie-talkies and say, folks, if you're here for the Toy Story 3 presentation, you should just go home. And, and some of you, sir, frankly, you should just take your life. What do you say we just give people a, a, another week to do it or a, until... Okay. But well, let's just give an arbitrary... Tr let's just give an arbitrary... Let's just pick a day right now that is the deadline. Okay. How about August 30th? Okay. August 30th. So if you listened, like I said... Sunday. And you heard that and you thought, oh, I, I know three of those or whatever. Who knows? You might win. And just send it to um, editor at dunesteef.com. Uh, otherwise, I'm giving Marcus everything that I have brought back from Comic-Con. Thanks, Marcus. <laughs> you didn't drag Paul Marcus and told this. This conversation has derailed. So did we answer the question of when you draw the line? But You know, I think the answer to that for me would be when it stops being fun, when it's too much work. There was actually a time before this podcast came out that I did a different podcast. I did a podcast about soccer. That's football to ustedes. And it ran for three episodes. It was just a lot of work. I did it all by myself, and I put it out there, and I had no idea. I, I know that there were a couple people that did listen to it, because there were a couple people that, that, that mentioned it. But it was so much work to put together that I just wasn't having fun doing it, and I quickly quit. So I think that's really the answer. You're going to quit when it's more work than it is fun. So as long as it is fun to you and to me, then it, it's all right, then it's worth it. Yeah, I think so. And a lot of that fun comes from the fact that other people have fun from it. You know what I mean? If nobody comments, then it's less fun. When I go to the comment section and see that there's still zero comments three weeks after we put the episode out, it makes me sad and it makes me have less fun having done that. So I suppose if we really had no listeners, it probably wouldn't be as fun. And I would probably uh, get depressed and give up. But That's luckily, cool. John Smith has stuck with us. Thank you, Mr. Smith. So just say number three is Flight of the Navigator, and you probably uh, will win that shirt. It comes in women's sizes too, John. You know, when I was in school, I liked to write a great deal, and people, they didn't necessarily mock me for that, but they did question why I would do that. And, and uh, to me, the joy was in the doing. It was fun <laughs> to do things for doing them's sake. And I still feel that way a lot of times. I have recorded readings of books or stories that haven't got audio versions out there, or they probably do now, for nobody to listen to but me. And was it a waste of time? Probably. But I enjoy doing that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know. Maybe everybody has their personal line in the sand of when yeah, it I becomes so. a waste of time and when it's not. But because I'm a giant coward when it comes to sending things out or sharing my <laughs> work with other people, 
I've gotten quite used to saying it's okay if I'm the only one who ever reads this or I'm the only one who ever hears this. Even if people beg you to give it to them so they can read it, it's still okay. I've never had a woman beg me to give it to them. Wait, I've never I've never had anybody beg me to give it to them. I've begged you to give me some of your dang stories to read and you're always like, I'm sorry, you will never read that. Is that how I sound? No, that's just the uh, I'm too cool voice. <laughs> Folks, if you knew me at all, I've never been too cool for anything. You said it, Rish. So it looks like we've come to the end of our show. At last. That's what the folks at home that have been listening are saying. But yes, thanks for listening, folks. Thanks for making it all the way to the end. I hope you enjoyed the show. Thanks to Rick for the story. And thanks to you, our listener. That's right. We still have one listener. (laughs) We haven't mentioned you by name for a long time, Mr. Smith. Thank you for sticking with us for a whole year. That's right. Our honorary listener. (laughs) Wait, honorary means that he didn't actually do... Has Mr. Smith passed away? (laughs) You know, he quit listening a long time ago. We now have only zero. That's right. He is the honorary listener because even he couldn't stand it anymore. But yes, so that's the end of our episode. I'm Rich Outfield. And I'm Big Inklevich. And then, in the second reconciliation of the McKetrick supplicants, they chose a new form for him, that of a giant slur. Many shubs and zools knew what it was to be roasted in the belly of the slur that day, I can tell you. Good night. Slur. Do you have something to say about today's episode? Drop by our website at doonstief.com and leave a comment. Rish, look, an alien! The Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine is published under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. So please share our show with everyone you know, but don't alter the files or try to sell them. Take two. Author's note. I got the idea for time in a (laughs) row. Do I get to do nothing in this episode? Go. I got the idea for two minutes. No, don't do it. Hey, so you know the good news, I'm sorry. I apologize. I know people hate that. That would. Be... I remember there was this stand-up comedian, and she was Asian, and she go, I, I also go, oh, yeah, yeah, and the audience laughed, and then she said, "Don't do that. Don't do that to an Asian person. It's like that's very offensive to us. And what's worse, sometimes we understand you." <laughs> it was really. Nice. Uh.